preaching holiness today. And I'm going to preach it hard. I'm a Nazarene preacher. And I am never and never will be and never have been wishy-washy about the holiness of God's saints. I'm not perfect. I'll never say that either. But I totally believe in the doctrine of this church. Romans chapter 7, beginning with verse 14. I'm reading from the message. Please follow along in your Bibles. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome. I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I am not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another. Doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets, better, gets the better of me every time. And it happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything, and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? <coughs> Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions, where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. In the NIV, it reads this way. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. The New King James Version says it this way. How to perform what is good, I do not find. And the Revised Standard Version says, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. Paul's got a problem. And so do we. Many of us holiness folk are still going through life here in Romans 7. The doctrine of the Church of the Nazarene is basically Romans 6, 7, and 8. The theology of holiness by the Apostle Paul. Six tells us we are sinners. 
7 says we're saved, but we still struggle with sin. And 8 says when we have moved on, we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we are spirit-led and we live a holy life. But too many of us stay here in 7. We have our own civil war. And all Christians will fight this. I don't care what denomination it is. Everyone who is born again comes to this point in their life and they have to fight this battle as well. Those who actively pursue the holiness life and not just the holiness lifestyle, which is looking like you're holy, but you really aren't. Will and must move on into Romans 8, which is life in the Spirit. And all those who have, they have found God our Father to be faithful to the promise made through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Power from on high to live this life. Just the way we are supposed to. Scripture tells us in 1 Thessalonians, He will do it. See folks, it has nothing to do with us. It's all about Him. <coughs> In this passage from Romans 7, we see the Jekyll and Hyde principle at work. If you remember the story, Dr. Jekyll, while working in his lab, discovered an elixir that he had hoped would be a benefit to mankind. When he discovered, what he discovered was that when taken, this elixir, brought to the surface every base desire and emotion, causing Dr. Jekyll to become Mr. Hyde. This Mr. Hyde then went about London at night doing all kinds of evil things in the darkness. Dr. Jekyll would not and could not do these things in good conscience. But Mr. Hyde had no problem doing whatever. And after a particular night of debauchery and murder, Mr. Hyde would return to the lab where at dawn's light he returned to become Dr. Jekyll, servant and helper, a doer of good for mankind. And this went on, and on, and on, until Dr. Shekel realized that Mr. Hyde was getting stronger. Stronger than he was. Stronger than his resistance. Dr. Jekyll realized that he was in danger to, of succumbing to the evil of Mr. Hyde permanently. He had to fight. And so do we. Amen. I am using Jekyll and Hyde as a metaphor for what has passed as holiness in the, in the past and even some today. Legalism versus spirituality. And the end result being living with the sin nature intact or carnality versus life in the spirit of Christ. Living a spirit-led life. You see, legalism, as taught by the church, our church, for years, and some of our churches still do, unfortunately, raised its ugly head at camp meeting. Legalism is that practice where we would be keeping the law or rules in our own strength 
versus being spirit-filled or born anew and empowered from above. We choose which, which way are we going to live. It seems to me that it's a no-brainer. Why would any of us who believe in Jesus Christ choose legalism over being spirit-filled or sanctified? We in the Church of the Nazarene believe in a second work of grace, believe in sanctification. And why would someone choose legalism over holiness? Because it's easier to pretend that you are holy by obeying rules. And if we think keeping rules makes us holy, then we are depending on our own selfish works. Our own strength, our own prideful will and we become all bound up again in legalism, trying to earn God's approval. <coughs> Rules never set free. They bind as tightly as the sin nature. Because none of us can keep them all. Even though we try, Satan's right there saying, you failed on that one. And pridefully we say, well, I'll try better tomorrow. Instead of doing anything about it. Many have tried and keep on trying to keep the rules. They can. Paul tells us here it is not possible. It says we need help. We need the Holy Spirit's baptism. We need a clean heart to start over. And only God can do that. For many, for years, people in leadership positions, in the church even, have demanded people to keep rules to the letter, even though the leadership failed in trying to keep them. They became pharisaical, hypocritical, turning off and alienating generations of Nazarenes who got so confused that they gave up on a holiness Christian life and sought something else that was easier. Legalism. Obeying rules. Spending so much time trying to look holy to other people That we become too busy to be holy. And this does not please our Father. Paul addresses this problem here with an example from his own life and ours. If we would be honest with ourselves, we can identify with everything written here. The desire to do good is present for every born again believer. The power isn't. The power is not within us. The power does not come from us. The power is not ours to make or give. The power is His. And He's the only one who gives it. desire to do good, but there's no power. 
God puts it in us through the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit has complete control of us, that power is then loosed. And our life changes drastically, radically. That's what Pentecost was all about. God loosed his power in and on the church. Now, I know they, there's still people out there teaching that, well, the Holy Spirit baptism is only for the apostles. And they're all dead. But if you recall and read that account again of Pentecost Sunday, there were 120 people in that upper room, and there were only 11 apostles. So if it was just for them, how come the other 120, the rest of the 120 all got baptized just the same? It's for the church. God empowered his church at Pentecost, and he still does it today. Paul had been a Pharisee. He knew the law better than any and definitely better than we do. He knew the Ten Commandments, forwards and backwards, and the other 700 regulations that the Pharisees had added down through Israel's history. You see, the Pharisees decided ten weren't enough. Ten didn't cover our entire life. So they added 700 more. They weren't a God, they were a man. Here in this passage, Paul knows that being made right with God comes by faith. Not requirements or rules of a church or an individual. Before, as a Pharisee, Paul knew which ones he needed to appear to keep so that he looked righteous. And in his mind, because he looked righteous, everything he did was righteous. Even the murder of Christians. This is what Jesus contended with every time he confronted the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Their ritual observations of the laws that made them appear to be more righteous than the great unwashed masses. They loved the holier-than-thou attitude. No wonder so many young people are turned off by the church. Because there are still too many Pharisees in the church. Satan tries to trick us. He puts into our minds that faith alone is not enough. The idea that we have to do more to earn our right standing with God is in our minds, so we try. The idea that it has to cost us something or that we must do something other than just believe by faith and receive God's gift. Rules such as, but not limited to. I just hit the ones you're familiar with. A believer, tithing more than God requires. We cannot buy spirituality. Give what God tells you to give, and that's all you need to do. Church attendance. Be there to look good on Sunday. But what about the rest of the week? How do you look to the world the rest of the week.
particular clothing styles and manner of dress. Focusing on appearance, not the heart. Modesty is the Holy Spirit's job. Dealing with believers. Although our culture takes it to extremes, it's still up to Him to deal with those who belong to Christ. Not us. God takes care of His own. And if a believer will not listen, they're going to keep going around in circles facing God over and over and over until they change. My favorite. The greatest lot upon the church our history has ever seen. Entertainment choices. Publicly, not being caught dead at some places, but privately inviting the same evil into our heart and to our home. We're fascinated by the world's idea of fun. It's evil, it's sinful, and it's not fun. It's devastating. Each of those rules, and that's the only four that I have touched on, each one of those is a look at me righteousness. See me, see my holiness. But all the while, inside the heart is not clean. And the life is full of dead man's bones, as Jesus said. The outward appearance means nothing to God. What's in the heart is everything to God. Amen. Settling for an appearance of holiness instead of the real thing is shortchanging our own spirituality. It's taking a shortcut that only gets us lost. Satan doesn't leave us alone after we are saved, to which all of us can testify. And I guarantee he sure isn't going to leave us alone when we seek holiness or when we begin to live a holiness-based life. He hates us. He literally hates each believer. <coughs> He will do all he can to destroy our relationship with Jesus Christ. And he will do everything he can in hopes to eventually destroy us by luring us back into the sin we've been saved from. He makes us doubt. He makes us compromise God's standards. And exchange them for the world standards. All you got to do is look at the church today. What was the big headline yesterday on the local paper? All the priests of the Catholic Church named and accused of sexual abuse of boys in the church. And if you were on the internet, right underneath, the Baptist Church had to get rid of their president. Because of sexual abuse. <coughs> and we see that the Church of Latter-day Saints changed their name. No, they didn't change their name. What they did was told their people, don't you say Mormon ever again. We're still Mormons, but don't you call us that. Because the history of the Mormon Church nothing to be desired.
being spirit filled, being sanctified. It's not a one time experience. I know it's been taught like that in the church. It's another crisis experience. It happens immediately, but it is not all at once. Because it continues on for the rest of our lives. Amen. Because if God asked us to surrender everything, and if he named everything we had to give up at one time, it'd kill us. But what he does is he deals with the, the important ones right now that are hindering our growth in Christ. And then as we grow and as we mature, he will point out other things that he doesn't like and wants us to get rid of in our life. That's sanctification. It's a lifestyle change. It's a lifetime change. And it's done by God. Too many holiness people got it in their heads that once experiencing the initial act of sanctification, if they believe in it at all, they believe that their struggle with sin is over and they just have to wait on heaven. I knew a lady who was as sour as could be. If she cracked a smile, her face would have fell off. Her attitude was just as sour as her face. And she would testify, it's okay because I'm sanctified. <laughs> you tell that to God. We were never saved or sanctified to sit. We were saved and sanctified to serve. To love. <coughs> to minister. To proclaim the gospel by our lives. Unfortunately, sitting and waiting on heaven after the Sanctification, unfortunately, is what's been taught and testified to for years in the church. If anything is true, our struggles with temptation to fall away and return to our old ways of life intensifies. Well, you have that, that period of euphoric bliss when sanctified, when filled with the Holy Spirit. It's like your feet never touch the ground. Your mind and your heart soar in the heavens. But soon and sure enough, reality hits you smack in the face again. And you think, well, that was supposed to all go away. And it didn't. It's still there tempting you. It's still there bothering you. It's still there because Satan uses it. Satan knows our weaknesses. He knows what easily trips us up. And he throws everything possible at us. And where and through whom it comes, we least expect. The good thing, Jesus knows our weaknesses too. And he is ready to shield us from the fiery darts of the enemy if we are filled with his Holy Spirit and we are trusting in him with our entire life. But, folks, if we are not filled with his Spirit, if we are not fully trusting Jesus, then we fight all these battles against Satan on our own strength. And Satan is not afraid of us we're, when we're like that. But when we're full of Jesus Christ and His Spirit, Satan's very afraid. 
And so that means we know how to pray. 